Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. This is the U.S. Navy's Marine Mammal Observation Unit. This group of men and women is tasked with studying the impacts of naval training, testing, and exercises on marine life. Over the years, the Navy has made a concerted effort to monitor and mitigate any potential environmental harm its various operations might cause. Here, the U.S. Navy's Explosive Ordnance Disposal Training and Evaluation Unit follows stringent mitigation protocols during a mine disposal exercise. At the same time, spotters look for dolphins and other animals that could be affected by the operation. If one does swim into the mitigation zone, the unit will delay setting off any charges until the zone is clear again. While protecting marine wildlife is important, the U.S. Navy is also exploring ways in which we can harness the abilities and intelligence of some of these animals. Perhaps the best example is the U.S. Navy Marine Mammal Program, which dates all the way back to the 1960s. The program mainly works with bottlenosed dolphins. Some of the most intelligent marine mammals of all. These dolphins have been trained to perform various tasks through extensive training and effort. Among the most important is mine detection. Specifically, dolphins are taught to locate and mark enemy sea mines so that Navy ships can avoid them more easily. They have also been trained to act as sentries, patrolling specific waterways to protect them from intruders. Finally, both dolphins and sea lions have proven their ability to recover objects from under the water at speeds that far exceed the capabilities of human divers. One of the primary methods in which marine mammals can assist the Navy is in the search for naval mines and explosives. Indeed, sea mines are among the most dangerous weapons a ship can encounter. They have been around in one way or another since the 14th century, but became much more dangerous and powerful during the First World War. They typically consist of a large metal ball with mechanical plungers attached. When these plungers make contact with the vessel's hull, they explode. Mines can be free-floating or tied to seabeds so that they float at varying depths. Contact mines like this are especially effective against submarines. These vessels travel and navigate using sonar and other electronic devices. Only when close to the surface do they have any way to survey the water around them visually. To 
make matters worse, subs moving underwater that have their hull ruptured by a mine will suffer catastrophic damage as pressure escapes and water flows in. Navies all around the world have long gone to great lengths to protect their vessels and crew members from such a fate. To this day, anti-submarine warfare and the countermeasures that protect against it are a widely explored topic among naval powers. Since World War I, anti-sub warfare primarily focused on using surface vessels, mines, and other submarines capable of firing torpedoes at enemy invaders. Later, during World War II, one of the most vital weapons in the fight against submarines was the depth charge. These are high explosives designed to go off upon reaching a specific depth. When they do, they create a powerful hydraulic shock that can seriously disrupt or disable an unfriendly submarine. That said, in order to be effective, depth charges must detonate close to the enemy submarine's own depth. For this reason, evasive maneuvers generally consist of altering course and depth multiple times in a short period. As technology improved, advanced sonar could be utilized to detect and identify submarines so that they could be successfully engaged. Since everything in and under the water has a unique acoustic signature, powerful sensors are often employed by surface vessels assigned to hunt submarines. In many cases, friendly boats and subs will employ sophisticated techniques to jam the enemy sub's navigation and communication capabilities. However, mines are not a purely military problem. Maritime explosive remnants of war, or ERWs, can be found in waterways worldwide. Be the lost munitions from sunken vessels, or merely holdouts from previous conflicts. it is crucial that these mines be discovered and disarmed before they can do any harm to innocent civilians. This has led to the development of the Navy Marine Mammal Humanitarian Mine Action Organization. The program has its roots back in the 1960s when militaries worldwide were heavily investigating intelligent marine mammals for their potential to assist with peace and wartime naval matters. Both dolphins and seals have been successfully trained to perform a wide range of actions. Dolphins, in particular, possess powerful natural sonar and can dive up to 990 feet in certain conditions. Specifically, the Mark 7 Division of the Navy Marine Mammal Humanitarian Mine Action Organization utilizes bottlenose dolphins to search for, mark, and even neutralize mines located deep underwater. Specifically, the Mark 7 team utilizes bottlenose dolphins to search for, mark, and even neutralize mines located deep underwater. In fact, these dolphins can reach depths of more than 1,000 feet. But they often operate within the surf zone or within busy shipping lanes where mines might do the most damage. Using animals for military and law enforcement purposes is nothing new. In fact, there's evidence that this practice goes all the way back to ancient times. Unsurprisingly, the most commonly used of all military animals is man's best friend, dogs.
Indeed, the U.S. Marines, Army, and Coast Guard all have their own canine units. many of which are made up of German shepherds or similar breeds that are prized for their intelligence and ability to follow directions. The dogs themselves are called military working dogs, or MWDs. They're generally paired with a dog handler and can perform a wide range of tasks depending on their training. Examples include detection, tracking, scouting, sentry work, and searching and rescue. They can also be trained to sniff out drugs and explosive devices. In the case of marine canines, much of this training is done at the Military Working Dog Team Development Course in Yuma, Arizona, affectionately called Canine Village. The United States Coast Guard has a very diverse range of duties. On a given day, they can be tasked with performing maritime security, search and rescue, or border patrol. The organization frequently uses canine teams to handle drug enforcement and explosive device detection. Here, you can see a canine explosive detection team practicing helicopter hoist training. Since both dog and trainer can be called upon to operate in dynamic conditions such as this at any point, it's imperative that they be comfortable working amidst the noise, wind, and other distractions. To increase the animal's comfort level, a cowl is fitted over its head throughout the exercise. Coast Guard canine handlers and their dogs are very close, so they take the process of acclimating the animals to new training scenarios very seriously and very slowly. This only increases the chances the dogs will perform as needed when duty calls. The Air Force has long made the use of military working dogs. And much like the Coast Guard, they understand the importance of familiarizing the animals with potentially distracting equipment. Here, Air Force Staff Sergeant Edwin Alexander Argueta Hernandez and his MWD practice aboard a Black Hawk helicopter. This gives the dog a chance to adjust to the sights, sounds, and smells of the helicopter, both while it is on the ground and in the air. Collaborating on this exercise, is the 994th Medical Detachment Veterinary Services Support. While intelligent animals like seals, dolphins, and dogs can contribute a lot to military service, More branches are starting to recognize the potential for robotics. Oh. 
One of the best examples of this is what's known as the Legged Squad Support System, or LS3. This is a fully autonomous quadruped robot designed specifically to serve as a pack horse for a squad of soldiers or Marines. Though the program has since been shelved, the LS3 proved quite impressive and will likely serve as the inspiration for future autonomous supply robots. Throughout the testing phase, the LS3 proved capable of handling around 80% of terrain types. If it did fall over, the system was capable of righting itself in almost all situations. The main issue with the LS3 proved to be the noise generated by the motor, which virtually eliminated any attempt at stealth. After the LS-3 experiment, the U.S. Air Force attempted to combine robotics with all the best features of a fully functional canine unit. This resulted in the Tyndall Robot Dogs. These highly advanced autonomous machines use onboard computers, cameras, and other detection devices to detect potential threats without exposing humans or real animals to danger. In theory, they can move ahead of a column of troops and look for mines, ambushes, or even patrol a camp's perimeter, freeing up troops to perform more important tasks. While it's likely that animals will always have a place assisting humans in both peace and war, improvements in robotic technology may allow us to keep more dogs, dolphins, and humans out of harm's way. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.